Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the panel Streaming to Success. Um, we're going to be talking about Let's Players and streamers today and how they relate to uh, game developers. So I'm going to start with a little round of introduction. Why don't you go first? Well, I'm uh, Justin Stigio Slater. I'm a, a YouTuber or a Let's Player. So uh, I, think, I think I've got a, a good experience with relationships, windy developers and Let's Players. You know, being one kind of helps. Uh, my name is uh, Tim Remmers, producer and co-founder of uh, Team Reptile, uh, a game developer. Uh, my name is Alex Nietzsche-Porczyk. I was Tiny Build, uh, and we're an indie developer slash publisher that found success a lot because of YouTubers and now because of streaming. All right. So uh, I think we need to get the elephant out of the room. I, I, I really don't like panels. Uh, I think they're boring, so we're going to try to spice this one up. Uh, hey, could you check what you got under the table over there? Uh, okay. The the big frozen ball. There there is a bottle here. Yeah. So uh, we're gonna play a game on this panel, and I'm totally hostile takeover here. So if any of us just agrees with each other, like saying uh huh, I agree, then they have to take a shot of that. Does that sound like fun? Thank you. All right. I just so put it out here. Just put it out here uh, alongside yeah, the glasses. Yeah, I put that right here. Uh, there's also like cups. It's 11 a.m. It's 7 p.m. somewhere in the world. All right, awesome. I'll just give everyone a So uh, since you don't drink, um, you can totally just agree with everyone, and then the moderator will have the drink. Yeah, definitely. Sure. Cool. That's, a, that's a good idea. Martin? I agree with everything. Yeah, so. I get the feeling you were going to say that. All right. Um, so, well, that makes my first question a little bit dangerous. Um, because I was going to start with a little bit of a definition. Um, I mean, I think most people know what Let's Players are, but just what, why are they so important? Why are Let's Players important right now? Um, so I actually disagree with you <laughs> on, on the fact that uh, solely Let's Players are important, right? Because we saw this um, like phenomenon happen four or five years ago, where all of a sudden uh, the press mattered much less than getting a YouTube video uh, from a popular uh, Let's Player. Uh, but now I think that uh, the question is why are less players and streamers important, right? Because uh, oddly enough, I'm just skipping ahead to you know maybe the further questions, but I just want to put it out there that uh, now the cumulative effect of less players and streamers is leaning towards streamers. At least this is what we are seeing with um, uh, like uh, sales data, right? So we have about 12 games on Steam, and whenever anyone is streaming a game, there is a direct correlation with sales. With Let's play videos, it has been less and less of direct correlation. Okay. Um, Definition. Does that, okay. Does that, um, is it your experience as well? I think, with, um, I think what you've got to remember with Let's Play is that it's more of a slow burn. It's not so much, obviously, when you've got someone streaming a game, you're going to have any of the viewers that are watching are going to be interested in that game. But with a Let's Play video, you don't normally see you might see a small influx of views and therefore sales coming from a video as soon as it goes up but I don't think that you can I don't think you can draw that direct correlation the way that you can with streaming because obviously a, a stream's a it's a time sensitive thing whereas a let's play video is up there for the life of the channel so there's always going to be a slow burn on sales the longer the, the video goes on. Well, uh, do you also stream or do you primarily do YouTube videos? I, I'm just YouTube right now. When I come back from Amsterdam, I'll start streaming again. So, uh, don't you think that uh, most of your audience actually comes to watch you as a personality, not necessarily the game? Yes and no, and that I know that I've got a core audience there that I can play just any game and they'll watch me just because of me. Um, I don't, I don't know why, but they, they tend to do that. But um, no, I definitely think that you have to have a good game, and like in correlation with a good attitude and a good personality, otherwise people just won't be interested. I mean, you have to have that hook, otherwise people aren't going to watch it anyway. So, is that... I agree. <laughs> God damn it, Tim. Asshole. Am I allowed to say that? I probably am, right? Uh... <laughs> oh, right. Well, I don't think we'd actually open it, but sure. Well, you introduced... Hold on, hold on. Rules, I can right? help you there. Thank you. That 
It's a small starter. It was, yes, thank you for being. I didn't bring any chasers or starting any flow. <laughs> but yeah, I agree. Um, uh, we, we, did, we don't really have that much experience with, you know, with streamers, uh, much more with YouTubers. But um, we, we do see a lot of uh, well, uh, correlation with, you know, with sales and, and streams. Um, one example I have with a uh, Dota streamer called uh, Sing Sing. Uh, he's a fan of our game Lethal League, and he plays the game um, and promoting the game while he's queuing for Dota 2 matches. And well, we can can see direct uh, direct results of uh, of those streams because he's yeah he's pretty popular and yeah. So uh, he usually plays Dota, but then does like breaks for Lethal League in between. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, we've actually been seeing a lot of that with speedruns. Uh, people like to you know like people that play Counter Strike they'll like switch to speedruns for a little while. But I think the issue also that applies to uh, Lethal League is that the games uh, are very fast and intense, and uh, streamers get tired of them quite quickly. It, like, it wears you down. So we're actually seeing that uh, slower-paced games like Punch Club, uh, they are, uh, people can play them in their own pace, which makes it super interesting to watch and like, you know, seeing someone play for 10 hours straight. That was insane on launch day. So is that also um, one of the biggest differences? So you just touched on the difference between uh, Let's Play videos and streamers. Uh, is it that uh, Let's Players are more of, a, um, more of a personality and streamers are just more focused on the game? Um, streamers are much more focused on interacting with their audience. Uh, and that's like the core difference between making a YouTube video and interacting. Um, if you, you know, Quite often, there were a couple of big name YouTubers that uh, we were you know, watching their videos and then watch them play live. It's a totally different experience because when you make a Let's Play video, and correct me if I'm wrong, you can like record for 10 hours and then you can just slice into you know, like the more interesting pieces and make a 20 minute funny video. It doesn't work like that with streaming. It's a totally different skill set. And then you have stuff like uh, channel raids uh, on Twitch. It's like when someone uh, like hosts, uh, like ends their stream, and then hosts another uh, channel, uh, and that way the the host the channel gets like a raid, you know, like an army of users that come in. And uh, often we see streamers just freaking freaking out and like playing some animation, some music, and like fighting off the raid of other people's streamers. And that's something that you have to you you, know, you just have to be spontaneous. And uh, it, it's, it's totally different than the fact that uh, you need to know how to interact live with an audience versus being funny on camera and then slicing that video. Okay. So would you say that um, streamers, are, uh, streamers and Let's Players as a group are now more important than traditional media? I would say mostly. Uh, because um, traditional media people like keep on saying that the press doesn't matter and uh, to some extent that is true but it just de depends on what kind of purpose do you have uh, when you know contacting the press versus youtubers versus streamers because uh, often um, youtubers and I'm really curious on what your opinion is, is on this um, they will like choose which games to play based on the media based on the press you know, like, uh, so when Goat Simulator went all over the place, or Surgeon Simulator, uh, all of the press were all over that. And to me, it felt like there was a direct correlation between YouTubers finding those videos uh, via the press. And then uh, it's very similar for Twitch streamers. Uh, yeah, I can, can add to that um, traditional media is, was important for us uh, with Lethal League as well, uh, because we are... Uh, we have quite a specific uh, target audience with, with the game. It's the, the fighting game community, and there are uh, a few websites committed to the fighting game community um, that we needed to get the word out about the game to the, the crowd we wanted to reach. Mm. And Stiju, how does that work for you? Do you also find that um, you, you base your game choices on, uh, on traditional media, or do you go out and find games yourself that you like? I, I never look at traditional media at all. Um, I don't know, I feel like nowadays that YouTube and Twitch is so much more important than traditional media because I feel like there's this distrust now of traditional media and that like, there's, there's so many memes out there now about um, like IGN giving ridiculously high scores, etc. I'm not, <laughs> not going to go into it. Well, like, look at Street Fighter. It just launched. Uh, Metascore is... 81 out of 100, and user ratings is like 40% positive on Steam. 
Yeah, exactly. So you can't. People generally don't trust traditional media, and when I'm if I'm looking for a new game, I just don't look at traditional media at all. I I have a look at all any indie websites that I go to to see any indie devs that have posted like blog posts or anything talking about them developing a game, a game about to release. I feel like YouTubers and streamers in general are more early adopters, so we'll be looking for games that are just about to come out and we want to hit them as soon as possible. For example, Punch Club, as soon as I got the key for that, it was I done a video and it was up on the channel. So it was like that's what we aim for. We aim to be the first people there so that we get the the maximum share of the audience that are looking to find out about the game when it gets announced on Steam or when it gets announced anywhere else in traditional media, we aim to have something up for people to look at. But uh, sorry, I reckon uh, some of the YouTubers also check out other YouTubers to see what's hot, right? Oh yeah, definitely, <laughs> definitely. Uh, it's actually been funny. It was a Punch Club launch because um, that was the second launch where we ignored the like the traditional marketing book of, hey, you have to send out keys to the press in a month in advance because they have scheduling and whatnot. Uh, we didn't do that. Uh, instead, we uh, made it so that they were reporting on the fact that the Twitch Plays Punch Club was going on and that the launch was going on. And then uh, by that time, no one knew if the game was any good. That was the brilliance of that whole situation. People were talking about Punch Club, but we didn't send keys to anyone. I mean, people played the Twitch Plays Punch Club, but that's not the same. So it really helped that the game ended up being good when it released. But uh, up until this point, no major websites outside of like IGN, I think IGN gave it a 6 out of 10, great, good job. Um, no one else really reviewed the game. And uh, touching on the point of like that the audience um, like kind of, you know, is, is maturing in the fact that they know what they are going to buy or watch. Uh, my favorite recent example is Deadpool, right? Uh, that was just the marketing campaign behind that made everyone want to see it. It's like the first superhero R-rated movie and then it does incredibly well. I think the audience is just um, moving, you know, because it's an oversaturated market on iOS, on Steam, everywhere uh, is getting there. It's just the audience will decide for themselves what they want to buy without anyone telling them like uh, whether they should buy it or not. It's like you just put out the, the trailer and then everyone decides, okay, I'm gonna buy this. So Punch Club is a, the launch of Punch Club was a pretty extreme example of how to um, sort of rely on streamers. But um, you're all pretty, um, pretty positive about the, the role of streamers and less players in the, in the current media landscape. So would you say that it is now impossible to have a successful game launch without the inclusion of streamers and Let's Players? It's definitely possible uh, if you have like, you know, a platform deal where Sony goes on stage and like announce you at E3, then streamers will be all over that. But if you like, you know, it, hypothetically, if you were to purposely exclude streamers, you would not have the best launch campaign. Uh, because like the core audience of gamers, like most people who have started, you know, like on NES, they're already way over 30 and having kids and whatnot don't have the time, right? So now uh, we're slowly moving into uh, a phase where the younger generation is the one that decides what's popular with critical mass. So to your question, yeah? But um, you can't really exclude uh, YouTubers and streamers, right? Because they can uh, pick up the game themselves. Well, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. I mean, if we were hypothetically like, you know, just blocking everyone, like, hey, you cannot stream this, we'll sue you. So, uh, Nintendo then? Yeah? Oh, wait. Yeah, I <laughs> forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> How did that work out for them? Well, no one covers their games. So, now we get to the interesting part. So, um, given that we all, uh, that apparently uh, developers need to work with YouTubers and let's uh, players and streamers. How does that work? So, for example, Studio, what do let's players and streamers look for in a game? Are there certain games that are more interesting than others? Are there games that are just not playable or streamable at all? There's definitely games that just aren't playable or streamable, and there's games that you personally wouldn't play or stream. So, I like don't... Lethal League. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's just gonna <coughs> suck. <laughs> um, so, like story, heavily story-based games that are like one playthrough, and maybe they're only a couple hours long. Personally, I wouldn't want to play that because I feel like that takes away from the the value proposition for someone watching it. I feel like if someone watches me play it, 
they're not likely to go out and buy it. Right. So I would be more likely, instead of doing a long play of it, maybe do a review of it and tell people, but at the same time, I feel like I don't want to spoil stuff like that, so I wouldn't play it. But that's, that's just me. There's plenty of Let's Players out there that will do a long play of just a, a purely story-based game. Um, other, what do I look for in a game? Uh, something that can have some audience participation, because more comments, more engagement, more SEO bump up in the channel when people are searching for stuff. But um, yeah, anything that I can have a bit of engagement with. Um, I don't know, generally things that people will be interested in. Personally, I like games that I can min-max a lot, because that's just the way that my channel works. Um, even games like Punch Club, I managed to do a series where I min-maxed the heck out of Punch Club. So, and people really enjoyed it. But yeah, basically anything that I can min-max, anything that people will get involved in. Um, the reason I like min-maxing is obviously because people can tell me that I'm stupid in the comment section. Um, once again, more comments, more SEO. So that's, that's the main driving force, sort of what... Um, yeah. Anything that I can get my audience involved in is basically the main thing that I'll go for. Okay. And then beyond that, anything that I have to think about. So how does it work on the developer side? Um, so apparently there are things that streamers look for, and we've now concluded that streamers are really important. Does that mean that, for example, game design gets influenced by what would or would not work Oh yeah, on totally. streaming art. When we're doing Party Hard, we will be sending like three or four builds to uh, streamers and YouTubers. Just, hey, hey, play it, make a video. And then we'll watch the videos, we would uh, watch the streams, and then we would adapt the game design based on what was working and what wasn't. It was kind of like you know, live beta testing uh, on the streamer and then looking at what the audience reacts to. Uh, and just like to the question of how to you know, like work with streamers. And, like, your game has to be condensed into a very interesting small GIF that people want to share on Twitter. If that happens and people are sharing it and everyone thinks it's awesome, you have a very good chance of getting YouTubers and less uh, and streamers. That's at least our experience so far. Yeah, I uh, disagree with that because well, simply we, we didn't didn't change the, the game design based on the the footage we saw of uh, of YouTubers playing uh, playing the game. We released an early prototype of Lethal League. Um, well, about a year before actual launch of the game and quite some people picked it up already. Um, we, we used uh, the YouTubers as, uh, as feedback for, for the game, but uh, yeah, we didn't really change the, the core of the game because um, yeah, we, we, we thought that the core was strong already. Uh, uh, actually, here's, a, here's an interesting example. Um, Speedrunners, when we had released in Early Access um, two years ago, uh, it was a hit amongst YouTubers. Um, like, everyone loved it, everyone posted funny videos because it just makes this raging reaction. However, when we tried to do a push towards streamers, we found that the UI that we had at the time was so unintuitive to set up that people would get turned off by, uh, for streaming the game because they just couldn't figure it out. They were like awkwardly you know, like pressing buttons and then the chat hated that and then they just decided not to play the game. That was issue number one. We kind of worked on that, and we see like that's more intuitive now. But now the problem with speedrunners and, and streaming for a long time is that the game is so like fast, like in you know, one, two, three, four, five rounds, that and there is next to no downtime in between. So streamers just get exhausted by playing it, and we get uh, like the esports style players, uh, streamers playing it, but uh, they're not as fun to watch. So now we're kind of trying to battle that problem in in one way or another. Okay. Um, Alex, you touched on this earlier. Um, uh, you said that for traditional media, it's you know, common knowledge that you send keys a month out in advance. Um, how does it work for, uh, for streamers and Let's Players? Uh, Stijo, how do, how do you get your games? Do you email developers yourself? Do you get a lot of emails from developers that want you to play their games? It's, it's really about both. Um, normally, if I'm looking for a new game, I'll, like I said before, I'll check any, any of the indie sites for any blog post by devs, or um, I'll just go onto Steam and go onto the coming soon, have a look to see what I'm interested in, and send off an email. But a lot of the time, I'll just get an email, um, sometimes unsolicited, just with a game or from PR companies that will send me, um, here's a game, do you fancy looking at it, type thing. Um, but yeah, mostly, the generally, if I get a key after a game is released, I won't be as interested in it as if I get a key before it's released, even if there's an embargo on it. 
Um, I'm not too bothered because I know that it's going to be a fair playing field there. But if the if I get a key after the game's released, then the the general public's got a hold of it, and then it's it's a lot less appealing to me to play. Mm. And how many how many of those emails do you get usually? Oh, just about five six a day. Okay, okay, okay. And then you choose based on the. Um the criteria that you just described, right? Yeah, the, yeah. 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 Okay. depending on when the game releases and just a quick look at the game, see what it's like, and then I'll, I'll do about half an hour to an hour worth of playtime to see if I enjoy it or not. Right. And what's your, your experience? How, how do you so contact? Like, um, we, we found that uh, if, if you want everyone to be aligned on like one day, like, hey, here is a launch day, please stream it or post videos, then it's really good to have something special in that build that appeals to streamers or just say like, hey, here's an extra 50 Steam keys that you can, ju you can just drop to your chat or drop to your users or whatever. Um, it's important to warn people a little bit up front, like, you know, give them three, four, five days saying like, hey, on this time, this is going to happen. We're going to send you a key at this exact moment. And then if you do send that key at the, that exact moment, then people do play. Um, other times when we don't have the time to do that, you know, like when the game is uh, ready one hour before launch, then it's kind of like a matter of sending a very simple, very juicy email that has bolded out Steam key, cool GIF, and some talking points, you know, like some quick facts about like when the game releases, what platforms, what's going to cost, etc. Uh, and you know, the, the the important factor there is so that the actual build that people activate that they can actually play it. You know, stream it, that OBS works. Uh, more and more games that we uh, like get as uh, potential publishing things, uh, they just crash on when, when you do OBS. <laughs> and that's something you have to check. Yeah. I've got to, I've got to agree with that. And I know that, I'm, <coughs> I know that I shouldn't agree with you, but no, I've got to agree. Like, if a game doesn't run on OBS and I can't get it to work on like, either OBS multi-platform if I can't get it to record with the Tory, anything like that, then I just, I'm not going to cover it because it's just too much of a headache for me. Mm. That makes sense. So, Alex, how do you, uh, we just heard from Stijo how he chooses games. How do you choose which YouTubers to contact? you just start at the top and try to get as far as you can, or? Uh, we don't really segment them that much, to be honest. Like, uh, I want to say that we do, like, market research and say, like, hey, you know, this, uh, these and these people are going to be the more likely ones. I will very occasionally do that when I want someone very specific to play the game, like you know, beta or a specific level or whatnot. Uh, but we usually just, you know, you can request as many Steam keys as you want, and uh, there's no problem with spreading those. It's on you to spread those uh, in a way that you you seem fit. So no, just mass blast everyone. Well, we do uh, do some kind of ranking because. Uh, it, there are a few YouTubers we, we would like to, to reach uh, and cover a game. So uh, quite a few. Uh, well, we, we make a list with, with people we should make a personalized email for. We, we also do mass mail uh, a lot of YouTubers as well. But, but some people, we want to give them a yeah, special treatment to make it more likely to, to cover the game, uh, especially uh, YouTubers and streamers that are focused on uh, our target, target audience uh, fighting games. Okay. Well, that's actually one thing that uh, I forgot to add. Uh, alongside the mass email, what we found that what works really well is, you know, we send out the mass email, and then we just go to Twitter saying, like, hey, streamers, YouTubers, you just got an email. And then people go, like, I didn't get an email. And then we go, like, oh, you have 200,000 followers. Well, now you'll get an email. Can you give us your email, please? <laughs> and that just starts to go viral on Twitter, and that has been working incredibly well. Like, one of the reasons why Punch Club launch went so well is because we're just, like, taking shifts on Twitter, just sending everyone keys. Then we built this tool for Twitch that would send us notifications if someone is streaming with, like, over X amount of viewers. And then we just go into that chat and hang out there all day. That was like a shift-based launch. We had, you know, like we were in Seattle and Mike was in the UK, just taking shifts European nighttime and... Yeah, it was fun. Uh, and one of the things that you have to realize is that most you know, streamers, YouTubers, they're people. Simple as that. It's not a corporate entity. It's not like you have to go through like bosses and poops. Just say, hey, here's my game. Here's a gift. Do you want to keep? Follow me. I'll DM you. Right? Yeah, pretty much. Um, if you can build up that relationship. Even You're agreeing again. Yes, yes, I'm agreeing <laughs> again, yes. I was about to utter an expletive there. But, uh, 
Yeah, like if you can build up a relationship with someone, then they're far more likely to keep covering your game, even after it's kind of everyone else probably would have thought it, it had worn out as welcome. People are just more likely to keep covering it. If you can build that relationship early, um, it's, it's just like you were saying about uh, just sending everyone a key. Like, YouTubers talk to each other, right? Uh, surprising, I know. But, um, like, we've got. Oh we've my got, God. <laughs> we've got groups of people, so. Like, I'll talk to, to people that are like over a million subs and uh, they'll actually talk to us about games and like, should we, should we cover this? Have you got a key and how do the devs treat you? Because devs really like do focus on the bigger guys and it's like they, they hold them up high, but it really tells you a lot about someone is how they treat smaller YouTubers, like even smaller than me. Like if you, if you don't treat them well, then it kind of reflects with the larger YouTubers because, like I said, we've got these massive Skype groups where we all chat about this type of thing. So you really need to, to watch exactly who you're talking to. And I've had a couple of tiny YouTubers that I've known who have been treated really well by a developer when they've had a tiny, tiny channel. And they've just kept with that same developer throughout the life of their channel. So um, one of the guys I work with a lot, Arumba, he was treated really well by Paradox when he had a small channel. And now his channel, well, was he's over 150,000 subs now, and he's still covering Paradox titles, even though everyone else has stopped. So, you said you just get about five, six emails a day. I can imagine that if you're a lot bigger channel with you know hundreds of thousands of subscribers, you also get a lot more emails. Um, so. Alex, you said that you've had a pretty good success just taking shifts on Twitter and emailing everyone. How reliable are YouTubers in getting back to you or letting you know that they are or aren't going to cover your game? Two years ago, very. Today, not very. Um, what happened with YouTube is that um, like about a year or 18 months ago, um, the bigger AAA companies realized, hey, we need YouTubers. And that's where networks started to form around YouTubers. And that adds, like, you know, they, they do all of the monetization overhead and, you know, partnership deals. Uh, now, uh, with large ass YouTubers, it's very difficult to get a hold of them for anything. You have to go through their parent company. And that's when uh, a market, you know, starts to mature a little bit. You know, there are these processes in place, there are the big players, uh, there's like, you know, TV show spin offs that are happening, which is very weird to watch. Um, so now, yeah, you can still contact by Twitter, but odds are that you know, you'll get lost in the flood, which is why it's super exciting for streamers right now, because the AAAs haven't figured out yet that the, the streaming is where it's at. So now if you're to jump somewhere, then jump on either like, uh, well, just every single YouTuber you can find and hope for the best and treat everyone very well, or and or jump on the Twitch bandwagon which um, I think by this holiday season, the marketing plans that are being uh, put together for like November, uh, October launches from the big publishers, they're gonna include a lot of budget for streamers. And then, you know, even if your game is the best, you're gonna have trouble getting any kind of traction. Um, if you get big enough as a, as a developer, um, you get to deal with fake accounts. Uh, I'm sure you've both uh, encountered that. How do you deal with that? What's your, your strategy for dealing with fake accounts? Well, uh, in my experience, it's um, a lot of time wasting when you are going to check out if the account is fake or not. Uh, we, we have a use list, use list of uh, Steam Key, so it's easier for me to just reply to your account with Steam Key. Uh, I usually don't include uh, Extra, extra keys for giveaways. Uh, we, can, we can also, yeah, we can always uh, elaborate on that when they have a, have a stream or a video online, and we can always organize a giveaway. But just, yeah, if it's fake or not, I'm just sending the Steam key. It's time wasting yeah. to check yeah. out if it's fake or not. But sometimes it's it's very obvious it's fake, so I don't reply at all. But yeah. Um, so a year ago, I would have agreed with you. Uh, today, though, we found that um, the more that happens, and that happens a lot, like every single day, um, we always like make sure that you know we compile press lists, that we segment people on you know, like who is he, etc., what kind of keys has he gotten, and that actually builds up to something much more. 
uh, while, yeah, it's annoying to like go in and check if the streamer is legit or if the YouTuber is legit, um, usually it takes about 20 seconds because you can just see, you can go to the YouTube channel and then like check the business contact info. If they remotely match, then it's fine. If not, then we just say no and like blacklist people. The reason for that is uh, because at some point we start noticing, you get, uh, as soon as you send out the mass email, uh, you get keys that appear like for unresale websites, like gta.com. And we're like, well, crap, that's not good. And then Valve notices that, obviously, and then we get wrist slapped saying like, hey, you know, why, why are you reselling keys? Well, we're not, I promise. Uh, so it's one of those things that you really, like, uh, was, a, was a really small team, it's very difficult, but uh, if you want to ensure your future uh, launches to be successful or updates, really do take the time for that. And again, a year ago, I would say it's the complete opposite. I think um, that, um, just to continue on with that, I think that some developers take it a bit too far, though. I've had a few developers that they've, uh, they've made they, it like, so... contact you. <laughs> they've made it so that I have to go onto my YouTube channel, send their YouTube channel a message to tell them what my email address is. And it's, like you said, it's all there in the About page. You just click that and have a look at my business email. It, it all lines up. But, um, and you can even do that with the, the YouTube API. You can go into the YouTube API and just send, send it the channel ID and it will bring you back the, uh, like their email address, their business email. So you, can, like, you could do it automated as well if someone took the time to make the tool for it. But yeah, it's just because that can be a pain for me because I'll, like, even though I get five, six emails, four keys, I'll spend like a day just emailing developers four keys. So when I get a couple of them back, that's like, oh, can you can you go into your YouTube and send it's us like a message? Oh, crap. Yeah, it's just oh, extra God work. Six. Yeah. Um, Alex, you just uh, touched on uh, something else I want to ask uh, everyone about. Um, it's sort of getting more the the let's player and streaming market is getting more mature and you said that they're sort of incorporating in a way they're sort of joining bigger companies that are managing uh, multiple uh, uh, multiple personalities in a sense um, does that mean that it's also now getting more and more common that you have to pay for content on YouTube channels I have seen that become much more common than it should and uh, while there is a good business reason for that, that they're getting all of these sponsorship deals and like budgets from the AAA marketing launches, um, it's really making me mad when, you know, and obviously they're gonna like disclose that it's a sponsored deal and whatnot. Uh, we did a couple of sponsored deals and uh, none of them had good impact. I mean, you can argue that, hey, it was a fun event and whatnot, but uh, working, uh, you know, paying, thousands and thousands of dollars that and not seeing direct return on that, that that's a little bit off I mean it feels like uh, we're getting into a situation where with youtubers um, uh, the economy of scale will win so like huge budgets where like everyone plays the same game on launch day that has like a much bigger cumulus effect and then that transitions into sales yes. How is that in your uh, experience? Do, you, do a lot of your YouTuber uh, friends in the groups you were talking about, do, do they charge for their yeah, content? Tell us, do we're all friends here. <laughs> well, obviously there's a couple of guys who've done sponsored deals, but I've, I've got to agree with you again. Oh, I've done it again, haven't I? Um, I've got to agree with you in that uh, I think you're a lot better using a shotgun approach than trying to, to get these big YouTubers by paying them. Like, uh, like I said before, oh thanks. Like I said before, I think you're, you're better off targeting a lot of smaller YouTubers who might only gather you three, four sales per channel than hit someone big who's going to get you maybe, I, I don't even, like, I, can't, I couldn't even tell you what their return is. I know that if I do a video, I only get a, a click through of about 100 to 200 on the buy link. So I don't know how that works with channels much larger than mine, but. I feel like you're a lot better hitting smaller channels who might have a more niche market, who are more likely to get you sales that you wouldn't normally get than these big wide reaching channels that the only sales that they'll get you are people that are more likely to buy the game anyway, like people who are already going to buy the game. All right. Um, in the, the larger uh, trend, it seems that um, a lot of people have realize that it is now easy to buy a small camera, uh, set it up in their, uh, their study or their living room, uh, buy a game uh, at worst. Apparently, if you email a developer, you can get them for free as well. 
uh, and start streaming. Are there now too many YouTubers? Are there too many Let's Players? Are there too many streamers? Are there just too many of them? I think there are too many people that want to become a YouTuber or a Let's Player or a streamer. But yeah, everybody can become one, but not everyone becomes one. <laughs> well, it, <laughs> you get it's what the I mean? same like with music, right? In the 70s, everyone c could buy a guitar and you know, like tr uh, try to start a band. Where did that end up? You know, with big labels and then the occasional indie wonder. The same thing is happening here. Yeah, I, uh, I definitely think there's too many Let's Players. They should just all <laughs> stop. I will be the only Let's Player. It'll be fine. Um, no, like you said, it's a super low barrier to entry. I mean, you don't even need a camera. You just, like, I don't use face cam. Nobody's ever seen what I look like. So just be happy you get to see what I, what I look like. Um, yeah, like, it's such a low barrier to entry. I mean, most people have got a headset mic. And obviously, it's super low quality and pretty cruddy. But that's how I start, That's how my channel started. And then you can go and you can buy a professional condenser mic for, like, £80 on sale. Or what's that? And, Euro, about 100 euro for a professional quality mic. So you can sound good, and all you need to download is OBS, which is free. So anyone can do it. I mean, and everyone's got games. So that's how you're seeing a lot of, a lot of streamers you're seeing with these MOBAs. So you've got Dota and League of Legends, completely free to, to play, free for OBS. Everyone's got a headset mic, so anyone can be a streamer. But like you said, not anyone can be in, like an engaging streamer or a good streamer or YouTuber for that matter. So it's low barrier to entry, but I don't, think, I don't think that there's too many people doing it. I don't think that there's ever going to be too many people doing it. It's all market demands, really. Uh, I think a lot of kids see other kids with success and money and big cars because of YouTube videos, and they just want to have the same success. And because it's yeah so easy to try, at least, uh, there are a lot of people that want to become a YouTuber. Yeah. Remember that uh, South Park episode about live streamers, mm. like where everything is commented, uh, everything is narrated, and like all of the kids, instead of watching television, and the television is dying in the living room, everyone's just watching YouTube videos. I think that's exactly what's happening. Like the younger generation, they consume media totally differently. They grow up not knowing what's a phone with buttons. You know, I, I remember the Nokia that you could, you know, get uh, like smack bricks in half with. Uh, they don't. They grow up connected. Uh, they have a lower attention span, and there is something constantly new. You know, you're, you're like on five, seven social networks. There's something happening. Um, so the way that they consume media is changing. And now with the phenomenon of Twitch, where you have the, the whole user interaction aspect, where you're actually like it's a community watching experience. It's a, an equivalent of like friends getting together like 20 years ago around uh, like a TV show watching the X Files season finale. That's the equivalent of that, but in a chat, virtually, where everyone is, you know, like cursing and being uh, really offensive. But here, that that is a market demand, and that's what's driving like everyone to try to be a YouTuber, try to be a Twitch player. With YouTube, it's um, the book is already being finished, you know, like formalized with all of the uh, labels and whatnot. But with live streaming, it's still an open playground. Like anyone can create something that that's just going to take off. Like if you remember before Twitch became a Twitch, they were just on TV and there were like people just streaming themselves, you know, living in their bedroom and then selling ad space as banners on the back wall. And that was interesting. So we're going to see more and more of this weirdness before the market matures. All right. Um, probably a lot of the people here in the, the room are actually uh, mobile and, uh, and casual developers. Um, why aren't there more Let's Players and streamers that do casual and or mobile? Um, how, how would you have to sort of adapt your strategy uh, if you make those kinds of games? Is it even possible? <laughs> um, actually, shall we ask the audience, uh, who here is a mobile game developer? A few uh, casual game developers? Also a few. No, actually, um, not too many. So I, I just had this odd idea because um, uh, my mom, uh, she used to play a lot of like match three style games, but then she discovered one of um, uh, Spill Games' uh, multiplayer games called uh, Harvest Honors, which is like you play on the same board, a match three game, and it's competitive and live multiplayer. And then she became so good that she was like giving me advice on how to like make the game better and whatnot. And they were really hardcore players. So, well, maybe like the casual space, um, 
you know, now people know how to use Facebook, know how to use a computer, know how to use a tablet. So now the older generation is getting acquainted with that. So maybe like the next esports is going to be like housewives, you know, fighting each other in in uh, competitive sports. Like it's funny, but who knows, right? Like uh, I can just imagine like some game that is casual but competitive enough being like you know a 14 year old kid versus versus a 40 year old woman just fighting it off, and it's the same playing field, right? So that could be something interesting. Um, but I, I do think um, in order to get a casual game out there or a mobile game out there, uh, one, there is um, the technology barrier, uh, which means like if it's a web-based game, then you, know, you need to capture the browser. Uh, and if it's a mobile game, you need to use something like Mob Crush. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's unclear how that is going to go. Because um, everyone thought like 15, 20 years ago that, hey, once we have these like watches with uh, screens, we're going to watch television on it. No, we won't. We watch two second gifts of cats on them. That's it. So the way that we consume media is different. So I'm really curious on that, like uh, what you guys think about that. Just throwing my ideas. Um, well, I'm, I'm thinking of how a casual game or a mobile game can uh, get the same engagement what you are looking for uh, in, in YouTube or, or streams. Uh, because yeah, a lot of people are uh, playing GTA and know the game and having fun with it, so they want to see other famous people having fun with it as well. Um, for, for, for Minecraft the same, there is some, some kind of interaction and engagement. Uh, but, but with mobile games, yeah, it's, I, I believe it's a, it's a bit more difficult to get the same kind of engagement for uh, well, in YouTube uh, uh, videos or streams. Well. Right, we talk about um, mobile games and not really seen that many mobile games on YouTube, but you, you kind of ignore the fact that Clash of Clans is one of the biggest games on YouTube right now. And obviously Clash of Clans is an outlier for, um, for mobile games, but even just casual games, I covered a, I covered a game oh, about six months ago uh, called Ironcast, basically a match three game. Um, but the fact that it had, it was, it had strategy, obviously, with it being a match three, and then there was a story going on behind it that people did get involved with it. So people got engaged with it, and there was, there was underlying strategy behind just the, the match three as well. So I think it's, you need to go beyond just the, the actual mechanics and the gameplay, and you need to think about anything that can add to that. So, um, for example, with Ironcast, there was progression, there was, uh, there was choices and what weapons you used, etc. It was basically two robots, and you matched up, uh, like, to shoot or your shields, etc. And uh, yeah, there was there was strategy because you were choosing what weapons and different weapons did different damage, and you were choosing what robot to use for different sort of armor, etc. So you definitely it needs to go beyond what the face value game. So you need to go beyond just the gameplay mechanics. You can have a solid game, but it won't be engaging on YouTube if there isn't anything else under it. All right, um, I think I've got time for one last question before we go to public questions. Um, the future of Let's Plays and streaming, how do you see that evolving? Alex, are you sticking with housewife battles on esports? I, I genuinely like that idea now, because that's a huge market, right? And it's always going to be there. And yeah, who knows? Uh, I, I think we're going to see um, like uh, the the continued maturing of uh, YouTube uh, stars and is, is going to be uh, like people are going to write case studies on the PewDiePie phenomenon, right? So now that you know he's appearing on live TV shows, that's like the transition from being an internet celebrity to an actual celebrity, which is really interesting to watch. Um, we're going to start seeing that with Twitch, uh, but that will be a little bit different because when I went to TwitchCon uh, in last September, uh, that was the most surreal experience ever because there was a StarCraft II booth, Legacy of the Void, that didn't come out yet. And I was like, oh my god, there's going to be a huge line. It was empty. Like, there was no one playing StarCraft. People were just chatting and talking with their stars or with their, like, uh, celebrities. And uh, it's just a really friendly community, probably very similar to uh, the YouTube community. But uh, experiencing that as a game developer, I was amazed at it. And people were just genuinely interested to talk. Um, 
So wherever that goes, um, it, it's still an open book on how far you can take like the whole Twitch interaction stuff because Amazon had just announced the, uh, the Lumberyard, I think it's called, uh, game engine, which is free and has like drag and drop Twitch integration. So I'm really curious where that goes. And also, I really want to see uh, where YouTube gaming goes, where the YouTube live streaming thing goes. Tim, for you, where do you see it going? Um, uh, I'm not sure, because uh, we were not, not really invested into uh, the whole YouTube uh, phenomenon before uh, we, we created, uh, we started creating games. Um, and when I listened to, to Alex with a lot of uh, sponsored Twitch talk. Um, Which is best. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm earning my hoodie. I'm still like, you know, the hoodies that they give out, I'm just working for one. <laughs> yeah, well, for, for us, uh, with, with the company, we have to invest more uh, time and, uh, well, maybe research into, into streaming because we, we see it happening. We see the, uh, the correlation with sales, but we are not really uh, using that information yet in our games. So I, I believe... Uh, Developers, as a, as a developer, um, we are going to use the the resources of streams and, and YouTube to uh, empower the, uh, the the reach of the game. Um, yeah. All right. Yeah. So, from a creator's point of view, I'm going to. Well, I wish I knew where YouTube was going in the future, because then I could prepare for it. But um, I'd. I feel like we're going to see a lot more developers pushing towards, catering towards creators. So uh, I think Party Hard's got a, a Twitch integration where your, your audience can affect the game. Yeah, yeah, and so, suddenly a flying saucer comes in and yeah. shoots rainbows. <laughs> so I think we're going to see a lot more stuff like that, like kind of things that are enticing the creators to, to create content, which is, I think, is pretty, pretty awesome. And for YouTube in particular, I feel like it's going to go the way down like traditional business has went. So everything's going to get more professional and but professional, and it's going to be less about the personal interaction between YouTubers and developers. I feel, which is kind of sad, but with the MCNs and things, the the way that that's going, I feel like it might end up going that route, which is yeah, it's really sad. But hopefully, YouTube gaming is going to bring the it's going to be a lot more personal because then. We're going to be competing on a gaming space as opposed to a broad, a broad YouTube space. So, because that's that's something that people don't think about that much. That obviously, it's if people go to YouTube to watch gaming content, they're going to watch gaming content. But they're not. They might watch gaming content. They might go over and watch cats, because that's, that's all YouTube's for. Aren't they? Cats. Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, so yeah. So we we kind of need to that that segmentation will hopefully bring it back to being the, the close interpersonal relationships that uh, kind of defines the genre just now. Because um, it'd be really sad to see it move to being like super professional business. Clear. All right. Um, that's it for my questions. Uh, so we've got time for uh, some audience questions. We got the question for the YouTuber. So I don't know how to pronounce it properly, Stijo. Perfect. <laughs> so when you talk about you getting you know, hit up by developers and obviously having to be selective about the content you're creating. When you're creating content that's sponsored, do you see a backlash you know, after you disclose or do you disclose that it's sponsored content? And if you do, do you generally see that your viewers are not as happy with you because they feel like you're selling out even though it's your job? And how do you deal with that? Well, personally, well, first off, let me start with do a disclose. You have to disclose now. Um, there's been a big crackdown on people not disclosing and even just something, um, oh, what was the case? I think it was, uh, I'm not going to name any names, but they basically says this, uh, this video was brought to you by, and then the company name, like that's, you can't do that, that's illegal, you'll get fined, basically, so you have to disclose. As for backlash, um, my target audience is 18 to 30s, so they understand that it's a business for me as well as being a hobby and something that I enjoy. So I don't really see anyone that bothered about it. Um, but I have seen channels with a younger target audience have some backlash in the comments section, um, or oh, your sellout, uh, 
but generally it's if you see sponsored content one after the other after the other and then like loot crate unboxings and this crate unboxings people tend to get annoyed with that so I think you just need to to watch how you handle it as a content creator and not go like sponsor content after sponsored content and if you had a marketplace where you logged in and you saw offers every day instead of being reached out by you know shady emails every day check out this check out that can you review this game would you be more interesting in perhaps checking out those games, you know, because I'm sure you get, like you said, five, six emails as you grow and you're going to get 10. Would you be more enticed to, you know, instead go in, have a marketplace where they're presented and then you pick the offer? So right now there, there are a couple of websites that you can go on to for, if you're just looking for games, if you're, if you're wanting game keys, um, there's also a couple of websites that you can go on to if you want to apply for sponsored content. Um, not so much in the, the gaming sector, there's, uh, but there, there are different things that you can go to to apply for sponsored content. And there's a couple of websites like uh, Keymailer is one of them where you can go on, you can request a key, and basically they reach out to the developers for you. But uh, they're not that great, to be honest. Uh, I much prefer the, the personal, even if it's just an email sent to me and it's a mass email and I can tell it's a mass email, I much prefer that than like these marketplaces that you've got. Um, and on, on the subject of emails, if you're sending out a mass email as a developer, just don't have it just a wall of text. Just embed an image or something in there so it stands out a bit because wall of text just gets ignored. As a, I want to add, as a, as a developer, it's yeah, some kind of annoying for me to see if a YouTuber is sponsored by G2A, for example, and um, they, they have a great video about my game and they say, okay, you can get this game on G2A with 10% off. But yeah. Where I, you didn't authorize that. In, where you didn't authorize that in yeah, any exactly. way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They're just like the key resellers that like harvest keys. Yeah. And that, that really sucks. But uh, it, is, uh, it is exposure, but yeah. <laughs> well, a year ago, I would you know, go yeah. for it. But now um, it, it's really, really difficult. I mean, it's also uh, touches upon the fact like uh, sponsored videos, if they're just playing out sponsored videos, that's not fun. Um, I remember when Legacy of the Void released, um, they did a series of sponsored videos with uh, Tall Biscuit, where uh, he was playing with other YouTubers like, um, like uh, the uh, co-op missions. And yes, it was a sponsored video, but I genuinely liked seeing them panic and scramble on hard mode uh, when like the, the swarms come in. That was funny, that was great, and that just sold the game and sold their experience. So that's fine. When it's just like endorsed, you're like, hey, this game is great, you should buy it. And yeah, that kind of sucks. Well, yeah, the, even the, the sponsored content must be genuine. I know uh, Total Biscuit, I, I saw a review of I Need for Speed, I, I believe. Um, he, he stated it's a sponsored video and it really criticized the game and yeah, destroyed it. But it was still sponsored content, so. Uh, they paid uh, paid him to yeah to crush them, <laughs> but it was a fun video. With Punch Club, he was like, "So I just beat this game, played it for ten hours. It sucks." <laughs> All right, and then he tells for twenty minutes why it sucks. Great. Yeah. I have a question for Alex and Tim. Um, what is your or what are your thoughts on uh, doing streams on Twitch or making videos on YouTube yourself, like as a developer? How why wouldn't or would you do that? It's actually funny because we did the joint stream once uh, where we played uh, Lethal League and Speedruns, I believe. Uh, and that was fun. We had, I think, under 100 viewers. Um, so far, our initiatives of um, trying to stream or make YouTube videos were kind of boring. Um, so people don't really want to watch. However, what did take off tremendously for us is uh, we did, um, in Speedruns, this, like, we had two players fighting each other. Uh, like on the forums because they were like the top one and top two and they hate the share. So we were like, okay, trial by combat. Let's see who actually wins. So we like set up this official live stream called it King of Speed uh, and got the two players to play. And we had like 400 people watching. So now we're going to continue doing that. Yeah, well, what, what I also tried is um, joining the, the stream chat and challenging the actual streamer. So that was pretty fun. And yeah, people find it fun to see the streamer battling the, the actual developer and getting wrecked. Yeah. <laughs> it was fun. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, guys.